Hallelujah. 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 Good morning, everyone. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to open in a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you are the God that still pursues us. Lord, that your goodness runs after us. Lord, I, Lord we, we come this morning as a people that, Lord, we don't need anything else. All we need is you, God. God, as everybody said, God, Lord, that nothing else matters in this world but you. God, I pray as we come as a church, preparing our heart to serve the king and to praise the king of king, I pray that whatever distraction may have in our mind and in our heart, Lord, I ask that you will remove it this morning, that the people of God will worship you in spirit and in truth, that everything that in our heart will align with you. God, if anything in our heart that's not right in our heart, that's causing us from, from not entering into you, God, this morning, I pray that you will come. Holy Spirit, do your work that you begin to remove anything from our heart that's not good. Throughout the week that a lot of things of this life may throw at us, but God, you are good. Every time, no matter where we turn, that your goodness and your faithfulness is always there. Remind us as a people of God, Lord, that we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That this morning that we will throw our hands, that we will dance before you, that we will raise our voice with, uh, with our hearts bent before you, God. I pray that you will come. Holy Spirit, come and do a move in your people this morning. As we worship you, as we honor you this morning, Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul.
lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Had I lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Had I lost another one.
In robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on the Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sing it again. You shall return.
by my own strength and only by the blood. It's not by a self-help book, but it's only by the blood. It's not by wishful thinking, it's only by the blood of Jesus. Everything within me, bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. I will walk the narrow way, the only road that will lead to life, and I will stay the narrow way to see the face of the one. 
church, he is the only way, the only truth, the only life. No one comes to the Father except through him. No one, no one comes to the Father, not the goodest person that you know, not the sweetest old lady that you know, not the most generous person in this world, not the greatest philanthropist you've ever seen. No one comes to the, the Father except through the Son. If you have been trying to find another way to the Father, if you have been trying to just skirt around all that Jesus has asked us to do, he's not just saying, oh, I believe in him. Yeah, so I believe in Jesus, so that means that I'm good, right? He's not just saying that belief is it, but coming to the Son means coming under the authority of the Son, the leadership of the Son, the sacrifice, the commandments of the Son. Living according to what the Son has, has offered. no other way. He's the treasure. He's the prize. He's what your heart longs for. Everything else is disguised to look like him. He is the authentic, purest form of the Father. There's no other way. Subject yourself to the word of God, the authority of God. It's worth it. It's hard. It's worth it. It's a sacrifice, but it doesn't compare. It doesn't compare. Is it even sacrifice if I trade this world for him? It doesn't even compare. and compassionate and as far as the east is from the west he can cast our transgression so if you are struggling to come under the authority of Jesus to find your path to the Father I encourage you to respond this morning respond to the calling of the Holy Spirit respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit maybe you've been walking this thing for a long time but now you've tried to figure out other ways to make things happen to do it on your own to go your own direction and the Lord's just good he'll forgive me I, I encourage you I, I plead with you come under his authority
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, church. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Can, can, I, can I take a moment, and Pastor Justin, can we stay in that song? Because I want to come right back to this. But can I take a moment just to fix your posture a little bit? Remember when we were little kids and the teacher would tell you to sit up straight, right? Because your posture was off. So can I just take a second to fix your posture this morning? You see, because as I look at it, I think we've been kind of following something that's been a mis, a mis uh, information or a mistake. Because we say, you know, the, the Spirit of God is chasing after me. That he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And even us as pastors, we get up here and we say that God is chasing after you. But can I say, show you something this morning? When God is chasing me, God is here, I'm here, I'm facing away from God. He's chasing after me. But this morning, can we change our posture? Can we turn and can we chase after the living God? Can we seek after him? David's word says that he was a man after God's own heart. He chased after the Lord. So can we all stand on our feet just for one last minute to sing to the Lord our God, to the Lord your Savior. Can we change our posture this morning? And instead of having God chase us, can we chase our Lord? Can we sing that chorus one more time? You know, at the end of the book of Job, Job says, I heard about you, but now I see you. You know, I, I think that a lot of us, a lot of us have, have been walking with God, and, and God has been blessing us, but we have never had a true encounter with God. You see, Job had been walking with God. He was known as a devout man after God, but he had not had an encounter until the end of the book. You see, we have to have an encounter with God. And the only way that we can have an encounter with our Lord and Savior is that if we change our posture, that if we start to chase after him, that if we start to seek him, if we start to praise him, because he is the one and only, he is the God of gods, the King of kings, and there is none like him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Precious God. Lord, my prayer this morning, Lord, my prayer this morning, Lord, is, Lord, change our posture. Lord, may our eyes, Lord, be on you. Lord, no longer, Lord, are you chasing after us. But God, may we turn and chase after you. May we be known as a people that are after God's very own heart. Precious God, do it this morning. Spirit of God, move this morning. Lord, we love you. We need you, Lord. Jesus, it's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. And Father, Lord, we just, we just give you praise this morning. Lord, we ask that you, Lord, would continue in this service, speaking our pastors. He brings forth the word of God. Lord, let your spirit just continue to move here. This is your house, your people, and we love you. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord some praise. God is good and all the time. Amen. 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 We have a couple of announcements this morning. First, good morning, everybody. If you're here for the first time, we just uh, we thank you and we pray that you come back and visit with us once again. And we pray that you be blessed this morning. I, I pray that maybe what just happened was for you. As we have our women's Tuesday night Bible study begins Tuesday, September 12th. There's been a slight time change on that. It's going to be from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. All right, everybody, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And uh, that will, they will be beginning with the Beatitudes. Okay, use the front door when you come into the building. Family Cornhole Tournament. 
Saturday, September 30th from 12, at 12 p.m. We have sign-ups for teams in the, uh, in the, the foyer. Um, also in the foyer is a, a sign-up for side dishes. We're going to have hamburgers, hot dogs will be provided. So that's a church family fun day. All right, that's, at, that's on September 30th. I still do couples potluck dinner. September, Saturday, September 16th from 5 to 8 p.m. right here at SEF. Pizza and desserts will be provided. Sign up in the foyer to bring uh, hot or cold appetizers. And for more information, you can see Kathy Roca. The Damascus Road Overnight Motorcycle Run, October 15th to the 16th. You can see our brother Al Floodquist if you have uh, any questions or want more information on that. Reaching for the Fringe Fall Fest, Saturday, October 21st at Christ Community Church at, from 1 to 3 p.m. Volunteers needed. You can see Elder Deb if you're interested in helping out there. Hey, we have our Kids Harvest Celebration coming up. That's Tuesday, October 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. Decorate your cars. Uh, 50 state theme is the theme. 50 states, okay. Choose a state and decorate your car. Uh, see, there's also a sign up in the foyer for that as well. As you can see, we have a lot of things going on in the church, right? And that's a good thing, amen. Can we have our ushers come forward? Hallelujah. Precious God. Can we all stand. Hallelujah. You know, to have the Spirit of God move upon you, it takes a simple act of will on your behalf. It takes you stepping out of your place of comfortability and stepping into the supernatural. I pray this morning that you're willing to take that step. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we honor you. We thank you for these tithes and offerings, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done in this body of believers. Lord, more importantly, we thank you for being you. Lord, that is not what you have done, it's who you are. So Lord, may our posture just be facing you as we seek you. Lord, let that be, let that be our song. Let that be our heart's song, I pray. Lord, we love you so much, we glorify you. You are good. Have your way here in this sermon, in this service. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give it up for Pastor Frank? Thank you, Pastor Les. Thank you guys so much. John, it's so great to see you here this morning. I believe I am. Is there my little green button on? All right, thank God for his wonder and grace. Crank these lights over here, please. Yeah, push those switches all the way, one direction, either up, 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 all the way up. Crank them all the way up, all right. Let's see, if you are here for the first time, we're so glad to have you with us. If you fill out one of these cards, and on the way out, there's a little welcome booth over on the right. If you give it to them, they have a bag full of goodies for you. And um, we'd love to get your information so we can stay in contact with you. I found this this morning. Someone gave it to me. I don't know who did it. Someone did it, one of the kids. We have a lot of artist children here. And uh, it's a note for you. Please take, open, and read. Be a light for those who are lost and in darkness. Um, God has great things for us. Amen. Is the person who did it here? You're not in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to I use it. I just wanted to give you attribution. Uh, God is so good. God is just so good to us. I, 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 I have a sermon this morning that I want to share. And if you were here, and most of you were not, and I'm, it's not a rebuke, but you missed something so special Thursday night. We had Jason Fuentes, who's our 
missionary to Indonesia here. He preached his heart out. It was the most tremendous message. And he really, and Pastor Justin went off on it this morning. And then Saturday, Pastor West went off on the very same theme on Saturday at the men's breakfast. And it's about the reality of the gospel living in us, Amen. not just going through the paces, not just checking off the boxes, not just walking a certain walk. And it was so powerful and moved the people that were here so much. All I could hear about from everyone that was here was what a tremendous sermon that was, what a tremendous message it was. And, and it dealt with the hearts and where we are in Christ. Is it just some words you said on the sinner's prayer one time? Is it just that we come to church on a Sunday or a Thursday or a Saturday or whenever? Is it just that? Or is it a relationship that changed your whole life, that took you from one side of an equation and put you on the other? The reality of the gospel, the reality of our relationship in Christ, and, and what it means to us and how it affects us. And oftentimes, and it is so easy, it's, so, it's just the way things work, entropy, everything slides down and we slide into a pattern, we go into a groove. Have you ever ridden on old dirt roads and they get grooves? And once you're in that rut, you may as well be in one of those car washes where you take your hands off the wheel and your wheels are in the things and you just come out on the other side and you can't get out easily. And we just get there and these kind of messages, these kind of things, these kind of little notes that a child draws and, and leaves somewhere are things that will take us and shock us out of a pattern of mediocrity, of a way of looking at, at the gospel and Christ as just something I do and put on my, my, my clean shirt on a Sunday and go to church. Because it is so much more than that. Christ is our life. The gospel is not something that happens on a Sunday morning. It is, it is the good news. It is the, the newness of my life that I live in in whom we live, move, and have our being, the scripture says. And so my text is out of uh, John <clears throat> chapter 15 and, and the first few verses. And it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every man, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide <clears throat> in me. Abide. Remain. Stay. Stay connected. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And he that abides in me, stays in me, is connected to me, stays with a vital relationship to me. There's the amplified, Frank Reedy amplified version. Um, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. But without me, you can't do, you can do nothing. And if a man abides not in me, he is cast as a branch, he's withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide, remain, stay connected, have a vital relationship with me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, that you bear much fruit. He said this on the way from the upper room, upper room, this part of the upper room discourse, on the way to the to Gethsemane, and where he would say, pray his high priestly prayer of John 17, and then be arrested that night. It was a full moon night. It was the time of Passover, and he's walking. And we've talked about them before. These great 60-foot gates with the vine all in it. Because do you know what he's doing here? why he says, I am the true vine. He didn't just say, I'm the vine. The vine had a long history. The vine was well known in Israel. In Psalms 80, talks about Israel as the vine. Jeremiah chapter 2 talks about Israel as the vine. Hosea chapter 10 talks about Israel as the vine. Probably the best one is uh, 
Isaiah chapter 5, and we have the, the vine song of Isaiah chapter 5. Let me read it for you. I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof. He planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the middle of it. He also made a wine press there, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Israel is that vine. I want to give you a look at John chapter 15, and I want to tell you what they would have seen first before I tell you what it means to us. Is that okay? Yes. He's looking at a people whose purpose and mission was to, to be the light of the world, was to be the witness to the world. That was the purpose of Abraham. That was in his call when God first met Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis right after the tower. He told him, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you. I'm going to make you fruitful. I'm going to make you so whoever blesses you will be blessed. Whoever curses you will be cursed. I'm going to give you this land that I'm going to let you walk through that's not yours. I'm going to give you cities that you didn't build. I am going to give you children, old man and old woman, who are too old. I am going to give you children, and your children are going to be like the sand of the ocean of the seashore. Your children are going to be like the stars of the heaven. And through your children, through your seed, I am going to bless the world. <clears throat> that is called the Abrahamic covenant. And that one part of that, all of those things were to Israel, were to Abraham, and then confirmed to Isaac, and then reconfirmed again to Jacob, all of those things dealt with Israel, except for one part. It actually it dealt with Israel, but it concerned us because it says, and your seed will bless the entire world. You are going to be the John the Baptist for the whole world. You are going to announce, you are going to show who God is. You are going to be the light of the world. You are going to show this world who God is and how to worship him. Amen. You're going to show that there is one God, the true God, who is over everything else and every other God, who created all things. You're going to show that, there's a, that this God is a, a moral God, that he has laws, that he has a morality, that he's holy, and that there's one way that you must worship him according to his plans. You're going to have a law that is going to be a picture of him, a picture book. I said this the other night. You ever notice when you're with little children, they can't read, and they have all these nice little Bible story books and all these books, and so they want to read a book, with, but they can't read. So you get the book, and you turn the page, and they see the picture. They know the picture. They can't read the words, but they know the words because it's been read to them before. And when they see the picture, they know what the words say, even though they can't read the words. You ever see that? Oh, you, you go, turn the next page. And they tell you all about it. That's what the law was. The law is, the law, that's for them. The law is for us because it is a picture book of God and of Jesus and of redemption and of salvation and his, what he has for us. And all through, as you look through the law, you don't have to worry about reading the words. It's a picture. Jesus told Nicodemus, and there's a serpent on a pole. And when they look, they're healed. Well, who do you think that was a picture of? Oh, it's like Sunday school. It's always the same answer. Jesus. You're right 75% of the time, so you always pass, even if, you know. <laughs> it was a picture of Christ. All of these pictures are of Christ. And they brought that to the world. And their purpose and the mission of Israel as a nation was to bring forth praises to God, which ours is too. Because Peter tells us that we're a royal nation, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, that we should show forth the praises of God. 
that people should see something and praise God because of what they have seen. And we talk about this all the time. And people see your life now, and they knew your life then, and they look at it and they say, whatever did this is so powerful and miraculous. It is such a transformation. I, I, I can't help but respect the power and, and that did this in your life. And that power is God. That power is the gospel. That power is Jesus Christ reconciling us to God the Father. And he does a work in us. And God is praised because of his work is on display. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And later he said, now you are the light of the world. And so as Israel was the vine, and Israel had the Gentile mission, and it was their job to spread the knowledge of God all over the world, that they would be a light, as Pastor West preached Saturday morning, a set on a hill, not under a bushel, hidden that no one can see it, but a light shining to the world, a witness to the world that they might fulfill that Gentile mission that in you, Abraham, the world will be blessed. But they didn't. They didn't fulfill that. And sometimes we don't fulfill it. And they didn't fulfill it because they became so obsessed with being a us for and no more club. A you can't come in because you're dirty and we're clean and we're special and you're not and you can't come and we can have nothing to do with you. And sometimes the church, we get just like that. We get just like that. We have a mission to the world, but we don't want to fulfill our mission to the world because your dirtiness might get on me. Well, that's not how it works. That might be how it works in the natural. But with God, that's not how it works. Because we have a connection to God Almighty through Jesus Christ, and we're filled with his Holy Spirit. And when I bump onto dirty, I don't get dirty. I make it clean. We have this thing here. <clears throat> okay. This is the most wonderful event. If you've ever been to our event that we have on October 31st, we used to call it Trunk or Treat. Now we changed it to Children's Harvest Celebration. And we park out here. We have a hay ride with a tractor and pulling hay kids through the woods. We have a campfire out back with the, they weren't puppets. I don't know what you would call them, Sharon. It's kind of like two people and a little guy doing dances and stuff and talking about stone soup, whatever they did last year. We have more candy than five Walmarts all put together on October. We have, and, and kids come, kids come from the neighborhood. People brought people from other churches, from other places. They brought them here because it was such a spectacular event. And we advertised this. And every year we advertise, the reason we changed it from trunk or treat to children's harvest celebration is all I got was phone calls to a trunk or treat. Sounds like trick or treat. That's the devil. It's the devil's day. It's God's day. Amen. It's God's earth. It's his planet. It's his sky. It's his stars. It's his moon. Amen. October 31st, December 25th. It's God's. It's his. He created it. It's his. The devil didn't get a day. He didn't get a minute. Actually, he had a day. He took that day and crucified Jesus. And, and hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We call it Good Friday. <laughs> oh, he must, he must have had a fit when he came back out of that tomb. But that's okay. That's okay. It's like the children's song. I got the joy, joy down in my heart. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ooh, sit on attack. Ooh, sit on attack. You ever sing that? Oh, that was a good one. So we have children's harvest celebration. And, and I, I already know, we're already advertising it. Somebody's going to call and tell me, I won't bring my kids to that because that's the devil's holiday. You need to wake up. 
I don't mean to be crude, but you really need to wake up. It's not the devil's holiday, it's God's. And we're giving children a great, godly, spiritual alternative to all the stuff that's out there, and we're having it here, and we're having it with people that love them and love God. Amen. And it's a tremendous day. And we're spreading the light, and we let our kids know that we love them, and Jesus loves them. And you don't have to hide in the basement because somebody told you it's the devil's day. Every day's the devil's day if you look at it that way. But every day's God's day. We had the Bible study the other night and, and, and someone mentioned to me the, 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 this new stuff they have going around that makes people like into zombies in there. They're so zonked out. It's a combination, I don't even know about it fully, but it's a combination of heroin and fentanyl and trank, some kind of uh, heavy-duty animal tranquilizer, and they make it into a concoction and they give it to you. And you're just, you're just totally zonked out for, for, like, for like days, and you can't do anything. You're just like a zombie. And it's like, and they, and they actually said, where's God? And it bothered me, because we always, where's God? I'll tell you where God is. God is everywhere. God was right there before they took it to the Holy Spirit, telling them, don't take this. This is darkness. I am light. God is right there talking to them when they did take it. But we think, where's God? Like he's going to open the heavens and speak like he has done before. But you know how God always operates? He operates through his body. He operates through his church. And who is that? He operates through you. He operates through me. He operates through you. He operates through each of us. We are the body of Christ. Why did Jesus come and establish a church? Why did he call out 12 and pour into them? Why did he go up into a mountain and call unto him whom he would? And they came to him, and he went over their list of names, and he ordained them, and he gave them power to preach the word, and he anointed them. Why did he do that? Why did he fill that small group with the Holy Spirit a, a few days later on the day of Pentecost? Why did he do that? Because we are his body. Why did he say in John that, and greater things will you do? What are you going to do greater than raise the dead, walk on water, heal the sick? What are you going to do greater? It's not greater in quality. It's greater in quantity. I don't have to go to Jerusalem because he's there. I don't have to wait for him to walk by to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I don't have to climb a tree because he's coming by me so I can scream out. Because his body now is all over. We are it. You are the body of Christ. Members in particular, Paul would say. Some are hands, some are feet, some are mouths. Maybe a few too many mouths passed away. <laughs> Not enough hands and feet. But I don't want to go all sidetracked. Listen, we are the body. So when you ask that question, these people are all zonked out. They're like zombies. What's going on? Where's God? Where's God? Are you a Christian? You are his representative. You're his hands. You're his feet. You're his mouth. You are the compassion. Your arms are the arms that he hugs people with. Your hands are the hands that he lifts people up with. Your mouth is the mouth that warns them and that comforts them. And too often we use our arms to push them away, our hands to slap them down, our mouths to condemn. But we are the body of Christ. Where is God? He's right. Look around. Look around. We are his children. We are his body. We are his church. Brother Fuentes, I talked about his sermon. His sermon, at Pastor West's sermon. They weren't connecting with each other either. They were like on the same theme. And then Pastor Justin's doing worship this morning. He starts going off on a theme. I'm like, this is the same. I went over and told Pastor West, don't go off this theme. This is the theme. It's, this is what God's talking about. You know, we're the church. 
But we get so wrapped up in, 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 in retreating from the very presence and essence of God that it becomes something we, we associate with, but it's not me. It's not me. He's saying, I want you in. I want you all in. We've talked about all. We talked about the, the necessity of being all in. And here he's, Jesus is saying, you, I am the vine. You are the branches. You need to be connected to me. You need to abide in me. You need to live in me. You need to keep that connection vital. You ever see a branch that gets broke, not broken off, just bruised? What happens to that branch eventually? Depending on how severe the break is, it can be brown in two days or it can be brown in two weeks. But I guarantee you it will be brown, it will die, and just be brittle, depending on the severity of the break. But we make ourselves a break. We make ourselves like, like church is a Sunday morning thing. And if, oh, if I'm real good, I'll go to Thursday night, Pastor Wes. If I'm really feeling good, if, if I'm just feeling spiritual, and I'm riding down the road, and, and every time I turn on a different station, it's just praises coming out of my radio. And I try to turn it off, but it won't turn off. It's just gospel music coming out of my radio. And, and if I do manage to turn it, it goes to some preacher somewhere. J. Vernon McGee with his Texas twang, talking about my dearly beloved. I love him. And, and, and on our best day, well, then I'll go to Thursday night. I'll go to Saturday morning. I'll go to Tuesday night Bible study for women. You know something? Let me make an announcement. I made a lot of announcements today, Pastor West, after the announcements. We had a full announcement sheet, too. But let me make an announcement. They're going through the Beatitudes on Tuesday night. Pastor West is going through the Beatitudes. It's been the foundation mark of his rally point ministry. But they're going through the, the Beatitudes on Tuesday night. We're going to start going through the Beatitudes on Saturday morning. Amen. I'm going to go through the Beatitudes on Saturday morning. Hallelujah. And then Thursday night, we're going to go through the rest of the, of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to tie them all together. And so if, if you miss it on Tuesday night in the women's group, you'll catch it on Saturday morning in the men's group. And if you miss it on Saturday morning in the men's group, you will catch all the in-between stuff. Not the same thing, not a repetitious lesson. You, have, you won't be able to say, I already heard it. You will catch all the in-between stuff on Thursday night. And we're going to do this starting in October. And we're just going to look at life in Jesus. What does he mean by this? What does he mean? And so my, my, my purpose of my sermon this morning is that we live in him. We live in him. We abide in him. We are connected in him. And it's not a Sunday morning thing. And frankly, it's not a church thing. We come here sometimes and we, I mean, we, we'll come, we'll sing, we'll rejoice, we'll praise God, we hear the word. That's all wonderful. But how much of that is, is our whole, that is not where it's at. It's at Sunday afternoon and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Friday night and Saturday. It's our living, it's our life. Our, am I connected? Am I abiding in him? Am I living in him? Am I walking and living in the power of the gospel? Or is it something I put on like my good boots? You should see my everyday boots. There's whole, they're, whole, they're ruined, they're, but they're not ruined so much that I want to wear my other ruined boots because I don't want to ruin my other ruined boots, so I just wear my same ruined boots. <laughs> and I put my good boots on for Sunday or when I'm with Donna and I have to look half presentable. <laughs> is, our, is our life like that? Is Sunday only a time where I put on Christ, but the rest of the time I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a shabbiness of, of my own way of thinking and my own understanding, and I'm not displaying the glory of God? Or is my life consistent? Is it congruous and one? Am I displaying the glory of God in everything I do? When people are mean to me, and people are ambivalent to me, and they don't 
even look at me and they don't smile? Am I being Christ? Where is God? The person said to me. I said, be careful with that attitude. Don't say where's God. God's, God's got it. Whatever God does is good. If you, don't, if, whatever God, if you don't think it's good, then change your attitude because God is always good. He's only good. So if it doesn't seem good, if it doesn't seem just, if it doesn't seem right, change your thinking because it is good, just, and right if God's doing it because God is always that. But here's the deal. You are God to many people. Don't get all blown out. Isn't that what, isn't that what God told Moses? You're a God to them. He told them that because you're standing in my place and we are the body of Christ. We are standing in his place. And we are, if we are abiding in him, abide in him. This was the last, I am the vine. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Israel was the vine, but they didn't fulfill the call. I am the true vine. That's why he said that. This is the seventh I am of John. John has seven I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection. I am something else. And I am that I am uh, in John chapter 8. And so he goes, this is the last one. I am the true vine. And you are the branches. And if you stay connected to me, you can do something. And if you are not, if you think you can got it all, all on your own, and this is something you put on like your Sunday shoes, then you're not going to do a thing. And Israel was replaced just far for that. Now, the church did not become Israel. Some people say, that's not the truth. That's not true. Israel has a place in God's program. Read Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11. You'll see that. It's the gravy. It will come back. But for now, he's dealing with the church. And we are his people. And we are his agents to make a difference in the world. And so, aren't these beautiful flowers that were given to us? If Israel was the original vine, what caused them to become unfruitful? Right? Fruit is mentioned seven times. In, in verse 2, uh, fruit. In, in verse 2, more fruit. In verse 5, much fruit. The husbandman, the gardener, expects fruit, abiding. Um, abiding is used nine times in John 15. Abiding is connectedness, is being plugged in. Listen, if we're not plugged in, we are nothing. We're a machine that's turned off. You can get um, Skynet. Remember Skynet? Any Terminator people? Skynet was the machine that took over the world and launched missiles, and they had all Terminators doing stuff, right? And so, uh, but if you snuck in the back room to that Skynet, to that main place the thing was, and you went and there was a plug plugged in the wall and you just went up and unplugged the plug, what would happen? Probably all the terminators would just shut off. Everything would be done, right? Turn it off. We have to stay connected to be vital in, in him. And Israel did not do that because they got hung up on being something that they weren't and it wasn't their connection and they did not fulfill their calling and so jesus said i have to be the true vine the spirit the fruit of the spirit in our lives is commensurate and proportional to our connection in him our connection in him can i turn to john chapter 11 i want to show something really quick about this fulfilling our call, fulfilling our call, fulfilling our call as his church, because Israel did not fulfill their call as his chosen people to evangelize and be the John the Baptist of the whole world, to be the town crier, to set the stage for the coming of Christ. They did not do that. And we are now his hands, his feet, we are setting the stage. We are the light of the world. We are his ambassadors, the ambassadors of the reconciliation to bring the world to Christ, to show the way, to show who God is. You know the old saying, you are the only Bible some people will ever read. So in John, I mean Mark chapter 11, 
it's a narrative sermon. We see certain things happen. Beginning at chapter, uh, verse 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem. He went into the temple. When he looked around about, he saw everything. And when evening was come, he went back out to Bethany uh, with the 12. Bethany was across. You go out the eastern gate, you go down through the valley and uh, up the hill where the olives are, the olive uh, groves, and Bethany's on the other side. So the first day he went there, he went out. The next day he comes in. On the way coming in, he sees a tree. He goes up and he says, I'm going to, maybe I can get some figs off this tree. And the fig tree had no figs. In verse 13, he said, because the time of figs was not yet. That means the time of full ripe figs was not yet. But you know what it was the time for? It was the time for leaves and figs growing together. And maybe the figs went all the way there, but maybe I can catch a ripe one. Maybe one of them got a little leap on the rest and I can catch a fig. And so there were no figs, and so he curses the tree. He went into Jerusalem. He sees the money changers. This is the second day there. He sees the money changers. He sees what's going on. His heart is broken. He flips over the tables, makes a whip, drives them out. This is the part of Jesus I, I think is so cool. Drives them out, drives them out of the thing, flips the whole place over. Don't think they had gods hanging around all those tables full of money. You know, we're all foreign people coming for the, for the f celebration. Does this whole thing. Let me, let me read it. And he came to Jerusalem, went to the temple, began to cast them out that sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught them, saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of all nations, the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves, a house of all nations. Where's that come from? That comes from Isaiah chapter 56. That is the Gentile mission. My house, my temple is going to be a house for all nations. My purpose for my people is that they will fulfill the Gentile mission. They will be a light in the world, and through them, the world will come to know who I am. And he says, my house, that's supposed to be a place for all nations, has turned into a den of thieves. And you're not doing it right. And he throws it all away. And he goes back out, going to Bethany, because they had cheap Motel 6s in Bethany. You couldn't stay in Jerusalem, right? If you're a regular person, you, you go to Bethany, because they have cheap motels down in Bethany. So he's going to Bethany, and as he walks out, there's the fig tree that he cursed. And Peter looks and says, there's the fig tree you cursed. Look, it's already dead. It's dead. And then he goes into prayer and says, listen, let me read the prayer part. Because we probably never have heard the prayer part connected with this other part. And in the morning, the next day, they passed by and saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remember, said to him, Master, oh, the fig tree, which you cursed, it's withered away. And Jesus answering said to him, have faith in God. For verily I say to you, whatsoever you say to this mountain, be removed, it'll be cast into the sea. And, and, and no doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he said shall come to pass, they have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. And, and when you stand praying, he's talking about and forgiving. Listen, we take this, we pull this right out of context and we make this a powerful prayer, you know, uh, passage, and we just quote this one. And you know the other one we quote? The other one we quote is in back to John chapter 15. Abide in me, and my words abide in you. You ask what you will, and it shall be done. Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Ask what you will, and it shall be done. Power, prayer, passage. But they're both connected to something. They're both connected to they're not independent. You can't just take them and say, I'm, I'm praying this, and mountain out. They are connected to being his, being in him, being fruitful, being connected, and operating as his. Both of those power prayer passages and all the rest, if you look, they are all connected to being his, being in his will, being abiding in him, connected in him, and doing what he wants. This is called an interpolation. It's like shuffling cards. You know, they do the cut and they get the two packs and they go, and they all go together and go like that. That's what this is. He shows a picture 
of unfruitfulness. It's, when you, let, me go, let me go off my notes because I wrote it so nicely. He visits the temple, number one. He sees a tree full of leaves, no fruit. He cleanses, he rebukes the people for un unrighteousness, unfruitfulness. And the solution is the power of prayer. He looks at the people in the temple the first day, and they are not fulfilling their call. They are not living what they should be. They are not, my house is a house of all nations. They are, we're just here making money. We're just here playing the religious scam and trying to make money. And then he looks at the tree, and he sees the tree the same condition. And this tree is just like you. This tree is, should have something on it, but all it has is leaves. He cleanses the temple. He rebukes. He rebukes the temple for unfruitfulness. It was a rebuke what he did that day. It was a rebuke of all of Judaism. When he said, I am the true vine, it was a rebuke of the original vine. You're not the true vine because you're a vine that I planted. And Jeremiah chapter 2, I planted you perfect. And all of a sudden, you're growing sour grapes. Hosea 10, you are a perfect vine. I planted a nice vine. I planted it in good soil. And all I get is sour grapes. Chapter 80 of Psalms, I planted a wonderful vine, and all I get is unrighteousness and unfruitfulness. That day in the temple, it was not so much as action against the religious racketeering. We have real preacher racketeering goes on today too, but I don't have the time to get into it with you, but there's a reason we don't do certain things here. But I, I won't get into it. I won't get into religious racketeering. Take me too far down the road that I won't get out of. But he saw that and he rebuked the unfruitfulness of it. You are a people that is unfruitful because you're not living in me. You're not abiding in me. You're abiding in systems and patterns and, 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 and a, a way that looks right but is not in the heart. And he looked at the tree and he rebuked the tree because it too should have been fruitful, but it wasn't fruitful. It's a way of looking at two things at once and comparing them. And he rebuked them both. And he pronounced woe on them both. And he says, I am the true vine. And I'm going to start something new. And I'm going to take the fruit thereof. And it's going to shake like Lebanon, the fruit of Lebanon, he says in Psalm 76. I'm going to take a small thing. I'm going to create it in the top of the mountain. The fruit thereof will shake like Lebanon. I'm going to send out a group of people into the world. And the world is going to be turned upside down. And they said of Paul when he came, those that have turned the world upside down are here also. I'm going to empower them. I'm going to fill them with my spirit. I am going to be in them. They are going to be mine, and I'm going to be theirs, and I'm going to live in them and dwell in them and empower them. And that through them, I'm going to change the world. I am going to send you out as a light into the world. But if a light only shines under the bushel of this roof, as beautiful as it is, if that's the only place the light is, we are a failure and we'll be unfruitful. Our lives need to shine everywhere we go. All we're doing here, all we're doing here, we're entering into corporate worship. We are, we are meeting people of like mind. We're rejoicing. We are charging up our batteries. I finally broke down and bought rechargeable flashlights because they are so bright. I never could have them because if I go into the wilderness for two weeks hunting or something, I can't recharge it, so it's worthless to me. But I bought them because they're like 10 bazillion candle power. They're so bright, they blind you. They're brighter than the super headlights I have on my truck, the KC Daylighters. They're so bright. And I couldn't resist that. And now I like the idea that it's rechargeable. I just plug it in. And all we're doing here is recharging our lights so that it can shine all week long. And if you're not getting involved in 
Tuesday morning women's prayer and Tuesday night women's Bible study and and, and Thursday evening service and Saturday morning and everything else that I didn't just mention. Then you better have some batteries because we're charging ourselves for our work, which is a work of every day because we are the body of Christ and members in particular. And we are the arms that will hug. We are the feet that will go. We are the mouth that will bless and lift. And we are the hands that will help. <coughs> Stand with me, if you will. And I don't want him to come by me one day and say, you didn't do your job. You didn't do your job. Someone else had to, or you didn't want to do it. And you're afraid to do your job because you thought if you came out and blessed some children on October 31st that you would be polluted, grow horns and a tail with a point on the end of it. Because you were so afraid of the enemy that I said you had power to tramp on and stomp on and, and, and walk all over. Because you were so afraid of the pollution of the world that you wouldn't get involved and engage and win our children before they end up with zombie land, taking all that stuff. God has called us, we're his body. Amen. He needs us to engage and be connected with him because we got stuff to do. We have people that are counting on us, that are counting on us. We're the light in their lives, and we may be the only light in some of their lives. They're counting on us. They need us. Oh, God, help us. Oh, to not be so stuck in a pattern of thinking that Israel was in and to be your people, to be your church, to fulfill your call, and to be the light of the world. You wanna come up here and plug in? It's like, a, it's like one of those uh, Tesla charging spots. You just come right up and plug in. Because God wants to send you out of here on fire, not like a Chevy Volt on fire, but he wants to send you out of here ready to rock and roll. What did they say? Cock, lock, ready to rock, dock? Is that the expression? <laughs> um, he wants to send us out of here to do something. He wants to send you out of here to do something. And if you're living in an experience of putting on the Sunday morning shoes, then maybe you want to come up here and get in Christ and live in him not be a bench warmer, but engage, engage, engage in this life, engage in our Christian walk, engage in Christ, engage in your Christianity, engage, engage in operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, engage in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, engage in living in the Spirit, engage in living in Christ, engage in having him change my life, engage in living for him every single day, engage engage and abide and plug in. I'll wait a little longer because I know. Hallelujah. Where is God? Where is God? They ask, where is God? Right here. Right here. He's in his people, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Father, have your way. Have your way this morning. Have your way in your people. God, I pray your anointing. I pray your Holy Spirit, God. I pray your anointing. Oh, God, flood your people right now. Flood your people with your Holy Spirit. Make the difference, oh, God, that you made 
Oh God, in that, that first Pentecost, Lord, where you filled them. And from that time on, there was no more fear. There was no more hiding. There was boldness. There was preaching. There was people being one. There, everything changed on that first day. Bless, oh God, your people, I pray. Fill, oh God, with your Holy Spirit. Bring us into the fullness, oh God, of the understanding and the power that is in our relationship with you. Not of us, not of our understanding, not of us, oh God, but of you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father, make the difference in us. Oh God, pour your anointing down on us, God. Pour your healing down on us. Pour out your Spirit down on your children. Make us to be the light of the world. Empower us, oh God, to conduct business for you. Empower us, oh God, to tramp on all of the stuff of the enemy, to stomp on every scorpion and serpent, to, oh God, conduct your business, to, oh God, shine for you, to be a beacon, to be a light, oh God, in the world, to, oh God, have your way with us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, I pray. Have your way in this place. Have your way in this temple. Have your way in this body. Have your way with us, oh God, in our minds. Deliver our minds from the trash, from the pollutions of the world, and make us, oh God, to be conformed unto you, oh God, I pray. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name. Have your way in this place, Lord, with each one, I pray in Jesus' name. Don't let us leave here as we came in, but oh God, <laughs> oh God, hallelujah, have your way with your children this morning, I pray. Hallelujah. Take your kids, take your grandkids, take your nieces, take your nephews. Don't you dare go out on the street. You come here on October 31st and uh, we'll give you a free hayride.